there's something called the 20 minute rule that I talk to my clients about, which is where if after roughly 20 minutes, you think you've been awake for, for about that time without looking at the time. So this is like a felt sense of 20 minutes ish. It's probably better to um, abandon trying to sleep at that point and do something else. Read, um, listen to some music, listen to the radio. But the the caveat to that is making sure that you're not doing something really stimulating. So you mentioned, you know, listening to world events. Well, if it's a kind of a, a bit heavy going, that might actually um, wake your brain up in, in a not very good way. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today you're going to hear from Chris James. Chris is a consultant clinical psychologist and sleep specialist. Chris has over years of clinical experience in the NHS, working across a range of mental health and sleep services, providing specialist assessments, therapy and training. He now runs an online based clinical psychology practice and sleep clinic and is the CEO and founder of Sleep Athletic, providing specialist sleep to elite athletes and sports teams. Sleep Athletic's clients include Canada men's football team, Liverpool FC and Arsenal women's F- FC. Chris is an honorary lecturer at Cardiff University and sleep's a massive issue across so many different services. So we're really delighted to have you on today, Chris. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you ever so much for the invitation. Looking forward to it. Hello, Chris. Very nice to meet you. And that's quite a CV, all those uh, very uh, powerful football clubs. So, um, Chris, we can begin by you telling us how you came to be so interested in sleep. Sure. Um, Well, it goes back uh, many moons ago. Um, I took an elective module um, in uni, actually, that was that was about sleep and dreaming, actually, which is people often think as a psychologist, I know lots about dreaming. And unfortunately, not really. It's not something that we go into as much. But um, it did spark an interest in sleep, certainly in circadian rhythms. And um, and then it was it wasn't really until a number of years later um, where you know it was this issue that just kept coming up in all the different services that I worked in so you know when you do your training as in clinical psychology you you work in lots of different types of services but sleep issues were everywhere and then since qualifying again um you just keep hearing about sleep problems but they tend to be I guess not not necessarily dismissed but just seen as part and parcel of other things you know of course people have got sleep problems if they're also depressed or anxious so if they're young people with um, you know, struggling to get on at school. So I just, that, that probably started things for me. Um, and then more recently, um, I, a very rare opportunity came up to work in a specialist sleep service within the NHS. Um, this was just uh, pre-pandemic, so about 2018. And I jumped at the chance just because I thought it was it's really unique. I mean, it's very, very rare for psychologists to be involved, actually. It tends to be very medical. So it sounded great. And that really then, I, I just found it absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, it's kind of taken off from there, really. Hmm, brilliant. So do you think sleep disorders are more prevalent now? Or are we just talking about our sleep much more? Yeah, that's a really good question. I suspect that some sleep problems are probably more prevalent. So if we think about um, issues such as um, like so insomnia, more and more the people that I'm seeing that present with insomnia, a lot of that is driven by something called hyperarousal. So basically where your brain is just absolutely buzzing and you can't switch it off at night. And if you think about the pace of life now, um, we are constantly bombarded with information, Um, not always negative stuff, you know, it can be very exciting and, you know, these exciting things ping through on our phone, but it's a lot, it's a lot for our brain to, to take in. 
and plus work and, and you know hybrid working people checking emails at all hours um trying to kind of do everything in terms of cooking picking up the kids working you know that there's so many things um and, and i think it's not surprising that people can then find it very difficult to um switch off um and, and then thinking about something like sleep apnea which we know is associated with um often physical health issues things like obesity and again it's probably not surprising that um we're seeing more and more of that um at a time where there's also you know concerns around perhaps pe uh, people's physical health so but the other thing is we're definitely talking about sleep more and thinking about it and it's it's become a, a hot topic and there's been some really good books written about it in the last few years so i think that's um, clued up everyone, both, you know, um, members of the public, I think everyone, just general population, I was much more aware about sleep and thinking, well, hang on, maybe there is something going on with my sleep. Um, and equally health professionals who, you know, it, it often don't get that much training in sleep. But I think now they're getting slowly getting better at spotting some of the signs and asking questions about sleep um, as part of the work that they do. Thank you. I, I used to work at um, a small unit at Gartry Prison where we had uh, 12 men with with learning difficulties and many of them had sleep sleep difficulties um, and, and we we really struggled to to help them with that actually so I'm really interested in how this conversation is going to unfold actually. And, and, and the thought, as I often did have, the thought of, of these men being locked up for many, many hours because they'd been locked up in the middle of the evening, sometimes the early evening until you know, half past eight the following morning in a tiny cell. It, it used to really bother me. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, understandably. And yeah, I, I, you know, I suppose if you think about that description you just gave, it's not surprising that that kind of plays havoc with our inbuilt natural body clock and thinking about day and night cycles and the usual things that prompt the brain to start pushing up melatonin and and but but if if we're then in a strange kind of routine that doesn't really fit with that because of you know we've got lots of artificial lights or we're being locked away or we've got different you know sort of meal times and things and um, all those things have got the potential to to throw off our our kind of innate um, sleep pattern. I know we saw the same thing in the FENS unit actually. In fact, we did actually introduce a sleep clinic. One of the nursing staff developed a sleep clinic to help because it was so prevalent, the problem. But, but equally, the prison system's way of managing it was often to, so issuing sleeping tablets, but then waking men up at one o'clock in the morning to give them sleeping tablets on occasion. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think I know myself that if I don't go out during the day um, for at least a walk, I will find it harder to sleep in the evening. So if you're spending a lot of time cooped up in a room, especially during the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and natural light is so important for our sleep. It really, really helps, especially in the morning. Um, and, and I would imagine, yeah, you know, perhaps some people in the prison populations are not getting heaps of that. Um, so yeah, that's um, and and it becomes a vicious cycle then, right? Because if we if we don't sleep well, we all know how we feel after poor sleep. You know, we're going to be more irritable. Uh, you know, um, it'd be harder to control our emotions. Um, and then that that shows itself in different ways in different people. So um, you got me thinking now about um, prisoners during the pandemic. I was doing a presentation on this yesterday and, and and one aspect was to to mention yeah the issue of um in in insomnia because if you think there were so many, you were talking about i don't know how many were in these closed conditions it was probably forty thousand people locked up for 23 hours a, a day one can only think you know this must have a profound effect upon their health in all kinds of ways that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Do you mean as in the, the pandemic specifically? 
Yes, yes, yes. Because normally, not always, of course, in many prisons, they, they're still locked up for many hours. But during the pandemic, mostly um, men in closed conditions were, were locked up for for most of the day. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if there's any research yet emerging that, that's looked specifically at the impact on um, people in prison to be deprived of that um that normal routine and and to you know presumably be getting a lot less natural light um so yeah i, I would i would imagine that sleep problems would have I, I mean we know for the general population um there is now research to show that um the pandemic did have a negative impact on sleep uh, for lots of different reasons um, things like so we're still seeing the effects now with long covid so in terms of the cluster of symptoms associated with long covid sleep is, is one of them that you hear about again and again um that people can be left with either insomnia or if, if it's not full-blown insomnia it's sort of um perhaps unrefreshing sleep or, or some sort of almost like subclinical symptoms of insomnia um but also you know that it, it was a a crazy couple of years for everyone and that that impacted on people in lots of different ways you know in terms of stress changes to the routine working from home um homeschooling um, all manner of things that would have really changed people's lives um, in terms of what that looked like day to day and and sleep is often susceptible to those kind of changes it, it tends to it tends to suffer when we have big changes in our life mm. Thank you. So what would a, a normal sleep pattern be, Chris? Well, I mean, broadly speaking, we are hardwired to sleep when it's dark in the, in the night and, and be awake in, in the light um, in the daytime. And, and unless you've got um, a, you know, a fairly rare type of sleep disorder, most of us um, fall into that pattern. But... Um, there are some other things to consider. So there's something called um, chronotype. Um, so this is where some people are naturally owls. So they their inbuilt body clock means that they don't really feel ready for sleep until a little bit later. So I'm talking maybe like midnight, one o'clock, whereas there are larks who are ready for bed a bit earlier, perhaps nine o'clock. And, and most people are uh, about 50 percent of people in, in between they're kind of neither owls nor larks but but so that impacts on when we go to sleep when we feel ready for sleep um the other thing is about duration so the classic is eight hours of sleep but it, in reality it's it's somewhere between seven and nine hours and that doesn't mean that everyone is fine as long as they get somewhere between seven and nine that means you know there's three of us here there's a fair chance one of us needs seven, one eight-ish and one nine-ish, for example. So and, and I guess unless you've really experimented with it, most people probably don't know what's exactly right for them. And, and I think that's where the eight hours is a very rough guide. It's, it's pretty decent. You know, if you if you had to choose a number that you said to people, well, that's roughly what you probably need, chances are you do. But the issue with that is that some, you know, some people might be only be getting seven hours, whereas really to be absolutely optimally rested they, they might be a nine hour person so the duration is another thing well, i was just wondering that because obviously if you're just missing one hour of sleep one night it's probably not going to make a massive difference but if you're missing two hours of sleep every night you know is, is that something we should be trying to establish for ourselves what our optimum amount of sleep is I think it's a really fascinating thing that, that there's hardly any research looking at optimizing sleep. So there's lots of research looking at the impact of sleep deprivation, of sleep disorders. But I th I think sleep optimization is a really exciting thing to, to think about because we know that um, poor sleep has a negative impact on like your memory, your attention, decision making. But what I'm I'm interested in is is also thinking about well how how good could your sleep be you know how how can we how far can we push it what's our optimum because equally we would expect that if you're getting optimal sleep regularly it's going to help us to feel a bit a bit sharper sort of firing on all cylinders so um, 
it, it's an interesting area, but but as far as I'm aware, there's not really been that much research looking at optimization of sleep. Thank you. So you've mentioned uh, obesity and sleep apnea already. Um, I suppose I'm wondering whether it's a kind of chicken and egg situation, whether the bad sleep contributes to obesity or the other way around. But I mean, what, what do you think about that? And are, are there other health issues that arise from poor, poor sleep? I, th I think a lot of these things are exactly that chicken and egg. Um, it's really hard to disentangle it. Um, also, you know, mental health and sleep, that that is a, a tangled sort of two way street as well. We know that people who um, are struggling with their mental health, whether that's anxiety or depression or trauma, uh, you know, the vast majority of them are not sleeping very well. Um, and if you're not sleeping very well, that impacts on your mood. So I, I totally agree. Um, we do know that. So this is an interesting one because. Um, there's a really good book that a lot of people know about Matthew Walker and why we sleep. And I think that's got a lot of people interested in sleep and I certainly recommend it. But for some people, it, it kind of gets them a bit panicky because there's there's a whole section in there that talks about the impact that um, poor sleep can have. And and it's right. You know, these these things are, are correct. But equally, I think it's, it's we have to kind of be proportionate and we're also very resilient and people are functioning remarkably well on suboptimal sleep. Um, I think when it's at the more extreme end, um, yes, it does start to pro pose a threat. So if, you, if you're living with undiagnosed sleep apnea and there are lots of people out there with it that it hasn't been picked up on, that's putting an impact on your heart because that does cause a lot of strain. And over time, yes, that does increase the risk of things like heart disease and stroke. Um, something like insomnia, um, long term, um, that can start to impact on your mental health, on your cognitive functioning, um, so memory, attention. Um, it can start to affect your relationships because you might be a bit more irritable, a bit more sort of scratchy with people. Um, it can start to impact on how you perform at work. But I think it's important to sort of make a distinction there between what's like a disorder versus a sleep problem. And sleep problems are really common and most people can get by without any anything too much sort of disastrous happening if they have a bad night of sleep, even if they get a night or two each week. But at some point it tips into like, well, actually this is happening so often now that this is impacting on the quality of my life, my functioning, it's impacting my mood, my physical health. So I suppose as you know, in, in my role, it's about help helping to identify where, where that tipping point is. And, and obviously you, you provide advice and then interventions proportionately really to where someone is. Um, but but it, 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 in a nutshell, I suppose, um, sleep is so important. We, we, we shouldn't neglect it. And I think we often, you know, things like oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead and those kind of um, sayings can, do sleep a massive injustice actually because it's something that we should be um, trying to protect for ourselves as best we can. Sounds like quite a tight, uh, it sounds like walking a bit of a tightrope there, Chris, because I can hear that it's really important to get a good night's sleep, but equally, if people start worrying about the sleep, that can also impact on sleep itself. So it sounds like quite a tricky, That's, tricky it, one. It, it is, it is, it is tricky. And what you just said then is, is so true. So I, I would say most weeks I'm talking to clients of mine who are, who have got a sleep problem that is made worse by worrying about their sleep problem. And that, that can be quite a tricky thing to, again, disentangle, because actually, yes, the more that we worry about our sleep, that wakes up the brain <laughs> at the very time that you want it to be quietening down. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting thing where we need to kind of respect our sleep and look after it and do everything that we can to increase our chances of good sleep. But equally, the more that we get panicky about it, the more that we worry about it and, and start to almost catastrophize about it, that's detrimental and actually reduces our chances of sleeping well. So it, it, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it is a bit of a tight rope at times. 
Do we know anything about that susceptibility to perhaps worry more about things in the evening anyway? You know, you know, it's like the sign of depression being that you wake up and you don't feel better. And most of us do feel better at the start of the day than at the end of the day when we're a bit tired. So are we more vulnerable to getting into those ruminative, worrying mindsets in an evening? I think there's probably something in that. I mean, I often talk to my clients about worry o'clock which you know everything seems worse when we wake up in the middle of the night you know how many times have you have you started you know you, you start to think about things that you, you're going to do tomorrow or you're thinking about i don't know sort of things that have been playing on your mind for a while but everything looks worse it feels worse in the middle of the night so i definitely think there's something in that but equally knowing that is useful because if you can kind of suddenly float above yourself and be like hang on, it's two o'clock in the morning. Of course, I feel like this about this issue. It's the worst time to be thinking about it. That that can actually kind of provide a little bit of perspective and, and help to just dial it down a couple of notches. Um, but yeah, we, I don't think we do our best thinking in the middle of the night. So therefore, that, that is not the time to start problem solving and figuring things out. There's the other side of that, isn't there? Because I've heard it said, and I feel it's happened to me on a number of occasions, that I've gone to, to bed with a particular problem, and then I've woken up, and miraculously, I seem to have solved the problem. What? I think, I mean, lucky you, that sounds fantastic. Um, I, I, well, do you know what, what I, I wonder what could be going on there is, is um, the, the role of REM sleep. So, so REM sleep is the sleep that is associated with psychological restoration. It's a bit like the brain does some psychological bookkeeping. It's kind of processing the events from the day. And if if I, yeah, my, my hunch would be that those, that experience that you described there, David, would, I reckon you probably had a good dose of REM sleep that night and, and your brain did some excellent problem solving and bookkeeping and filing away and, and presented you with a nice solution in the morning um, is what I suspect is, is going on there. But but, but yeah, I'm, I mean, and like everything I'm describing, this is the problem with sleep is that people want you to have definitive answers and be very black and white. And unfortunately, it, I can't be. I know no sleep specialist can be absolute about very many things when it comes to sleep, because you always get, yeah, but I had an amazing idea once in the middle of the night that's brilliant and you know well done for having that idea at two o'clock in the morning but by and large what i hear a lot of is that that tends to also be a very common time for people's worries to come out and start to snowball so um yes <laughs> but I, I take the point it doesn't happen very often i have to say more often than not i do something that's even worse i'm awake and i turn on the radio and listen to the world service and hear about all kinds of terrible things happening around the world, which is probably just the sort of thing I shouldn't be doing. Well, I mean, I, I can, would you like me to say something about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it depends on what you're listening to. So I, it, it is better to probably refocus on something else than stay in bed torturing yourself by tossing and turning and getting frustrated that you can't sleep so that is not a good thing to do so um there's something called the 20 minute rule that i talk to my clients about which is where if after roughly 20 minutes you think you've been awake for, for about that time without looking at the time so this is like a felt sense of 20 minutes ish it's probably better to um, abandon trying to sleep at that point and do something else read um, listen to some music listen to the radio but the the caveat to that is making sure that you're not doing something really stimulating so you mentioned you know listening to world events well if it's a kind of a, a bit heavy going that might actually um, wake your brain up in, in a not very good way um, so it's probably better to do something kind of neutral and calm for the brain if you're struggling to sleep in the middle of the night. And, and ideally, really, you should you should actually get out of bed and go to a different room um, just so the brain associates bed purely with sleeping, not with listening to a radio or reading a book or whatever, if you're going to be strict about it. While we're talking on kind of like that 
in the middle of the night waking, um, Chris, I was just a couple of things that I'd read. One was that people with ADHD are particularly prone to pinging wide awake in the early hours of the morning with sort of like stimulating thoughts going on and that not necessarily being dysfunctional unless people start worrying about it and, and, and maybe you could comment on that and a second thing of um, that perhaps our sleep patterns naturally meant to include being awake for a couple of hours and then going back to bed for further sleep um, if we were analysing kind of more um, you know earlier societies Okay. Um, in, in terms of ADHD, yes, I think there's there is plenty of evidence to show that people with ADHD are more prone to sleep problems. And, and actually, you know, I, I'm thinking about it. That makes sense because a lot of people with ADHD will say, you know, if you say to them how how what's happening in your brain at about ten, eleven o'clock at night, they'll they'll often be saying, well, it's on, it's switched on. So a lot of people with ADHD can have sleep onset difficulties, especially if they're trying to go to bed perhaps a bit a bit earlier than is natural for them. Because, you know, because often they have very busy brains. So it, I think um, even if that doesn't necessarily translate into full blown insomnia, I think it can be really helpful for people with ADHD to have some strategies to learn to wind down in the evening now that doesn't mean you know emptying your mind and, and kind of I, I don't think that's realistic and i don't think that's necessary actually but just tr trying to just dial it down a couple of notches is it could be enough to just help them get us get to sleep um what you said there about them actually perhaps saying but but they like it because i'm productive i get some good ideas or i get some stuff done and then i get back to my thinking is if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. So if they're saying I do this and it flies in the face of sleep advice, but they get back to sleep quickly and they're feeling refreshed in the day, in my view, that's not a problem. That's fine. It, it's yeah. OK, it's probably not something we'd advise on mass. Everyone does. But like all these things, it, it's it's kind of also having sort of tuning into what works for you. And if that seems to work for you and it's not causing too many problems, then then I think that's OK. Um, can you remind me the, the second half of yes, the question? Yes, the second one was that I'd read that um, in previous previous era um, that actually our natural pattern might have been to go to bed, at, obviously when it got dark, go to bed, wake up, have a bit of a gathering and then go back to sleep for a top up um, before starting the day when when um, when the sun was up. And I, I didn't know if you knew, I'm putting you on the spot really here with with that I so that it doesn't too. matter if you don't <laughs> I, I I fear that too and I think actually I'm not sure but I'm, I'm I, I, I want to say that maybe like the Victorian era it was it, it became popular to sort of have this two sort of two phases of sleep across a 24-hour cycle um, it's really interesting is it because I, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably not much research from that era that's um, that, that exists that that we've got anything to compare against so I suppose these are stories these you know this this is things that have been written and passed down to us um, but it's hard to know like okay that it happened but that doesn't necessarily mean that people slept well um, I guess in terms of societies currently that that do that again you know that I think that'd be fascinating to look at in terms of um, is that impacting on sleep quality? Is there a higher prevalence of sleep issues? Um, I don't know is the answer, but but my understanding is that um, that has happened over, over time in, in different societies of different stages of, sort of human evolution. But um, I, I think most sleep experts have concluded that we are probably hardwired to, to sleep in one long um bout and um culturally it, we might have evolved in you know in different countries different places to sleep in a slightly different way and maybe that doesn't cause too many issues so i get again that probably goes back to the idea of we're, we're quite resilient and adaptive as well and um, think about shift workers right so um you know shift work by and large is not something that you would ever advise anyone to do in terms of from a sleep health perspective and yet people do it probably does impact on health long term 
that it's quite remarkable when you think about it that people can can actually reverse their cycle willingly because of the job demands um, and and function at a pretty decent level. So I think it does show that we can be pretty adaptive when we need to be. It's very relevant, isn't it, to psychiatric services, to prison services, the idea of staff working on a shift pattern. Is there any research on whether it's better for you to be permanently or like I have known staff who permanently did the night shift for instance is it better to be permanently doing a a different shift to our natural shift or is it better to be um shifting around and having to adjust to different shift patterns yeah uh, again I wonder if it's there's going to be a little bit of individual variation like some people I would imagine would would have a preference those that have worked all those combinations might say, well, actually, do you know, what? I much prefer that. And and I think that there could be some value in actually listening to what your body tells you. And um, my my hunch there would be that it it's better for the because the, the brain and the body loves routine. So I think if you keep chopping and changing a bit like jet lag, it, it's going to be very hard better to stick to one rather than to regularly be changing that shift pattern but i have no doubt that there will be some people who say well not for me i've done that and actually i much prefer the the, the variation well you've given a really important message i think chris about there is something about listening to your own body and understanding the needs of or the abilities of your own own body and what your own body can can tolerate but i wondered how focusing on sleep has changed your practice as a clinician um yeah so as as you can probably tell um i do a, f a fair few different things then so so um sleep is a big part of what i do but i also do lots of work um sort of more in the sort of mental health area so therapy um, um i also do sort of teaching and what it's done for me is is made me think about sleep where, wherever I am and whatever I'm sort of w whichever area I'm working in so so I don't just think sleep when I'm doing my sleep work if that makes sense so even if someone is referred to me um or, or contacts me with and they don't mention sleep at all I will always make sure that I at least ask about it because so many people are living with sleep issues and, and sleep disorders actually that are just not getting picked up um so for me it's made me just much more curious about sleep and, and i suppose just making sure that i always um ask people about that um because i, I guess what i've learned is that people often don't get asked about their sleep um did you have anything in like I'm, I'm also quite interested in the question itself so in terms of uh, was there something else in particular you were wondering about sort of changes that i i would have made uh, there, was, there wasn't, but I was. I suppose I was wondering whether. So I suppose you know, sleep is very much a, a, I suppose, a bodily function, and as psychologists, we can often get caught up in, you know, response to to events rather than focusing on what's going on in our body. So, do, yeah, you know, I don't know if you listen to the Huberman lab, where he's very concerned. He's a neuroscientist who's very concerned with all of our bodily functions, and it's interesting how often there's over there's overlap between say sleep and, and uh, a routine for productivity like the circadian rhythm and what have you how that how that's interrelated and I uh, made me wonder whether it's made you more bodily aware as a clinician than you might have been just practicing as a clinical psychologist ordinarily I, I probably haven't framed it in that way but what, the, what, what you've just described makes total sense to me um, yes because even if someone um isn't saying that they've got any issues with their sleep but if if when you ask them to describe what their sleep looks like and their sleep pattern and even so i might hear things there that i think well they might not be translated you know you might not be worried about that but maybe that is actually impacting on the fact that you feel so stressed and anxious or or that you know there's there's something going on with your mood or so yeah and um i see what you mean and it, it's an extra layer i think that sits on whatever work um i'm doing um so yeah in, in that respect it, it's i think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about 
I guess what what got me interested and I can see now in retrospect why and how it gets missed so often by um, other health professionals. Because um, I mean although we trained in an approach that is invariably described as biopsychosocial I think actually for psychologists there's often been a lot less of the biological element of that in there hasn't there but conversely just thinking about the facts that I you know have noticed that there's a you know a, there just seems to be a, a a flurry of sleep coaches arising where that's their main that's their main area and I suppose I was thinking you know the fact that you're a clinical psychologist and I wonder whether people sometimes come to you for sleep coaching but actually there are underlying issues that really require much more of a mental health therapeutic um, involvement which you know could mean that some people are getting inappropriate treatment in other in other places if you've got a practitioner that doesn't have that that broad background in mental health that, yeah, I, I think that is often the case, actually. And in some ways, that's I think that can be quite nice for clients because maybe sleep feels a, a safer place to start exploring and talking about. And then when you've got that relationship, that's when people start might start to open up about other things going on for them. So I think in that way, it's quite nice to to know that if conversation takes us there, that's comfortable too. Um, and, and we can certainly, you know, I, I can help people with that. So that's absolutely true. But but it it, it, it does also, I, I suppose, leave me feeling a bit concerned about people who aren't necessarily therapeutically trained, but might, might be market them, themselves as sleep experts. Um, I wonder how they respond in that situation, because for me, mental health and sleep are so intertwined. I, I struggle to kind of sometimes comprehend how you can't know a lot about both really to work with it. I think I think equally um, now my mental health practice is definitely benefited from developing my understanding of sleep. I have no doubt about that now that I'm, 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 I think I'm doing better work because I've um, got into sleep so much. So um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's not to say that you know that there are obviously things like sleep hygiene there's there's generally good quite basic advice that is just good for most people to know about um and i think that you don't need to be a psychologist to give that advice i think you you know that's that's fair enough but um but it so often it can start to then evolve into talking about i guess um you know sort of pro pro deeper processes struggles um, and I think that's where I, I find it so helpful to have that core clinical psychology training. Yeah. Look, moving on a little bit, but, but staying along this theme, are mental health professionals complacent about sleep? You know, should we be talking more about it? How, any advice to how clinicians could get better at thinking about sleep and introducing sleep? Um, I'm, I'm pondering over the word complacent. But I think probably a little bit, yes, but in their defence, it's not their fault because health professionals do not get enough training on sleep. And if you'd ask most people, you know, to, to name perhaps the, you know, the most highly qualified type of health professional, a lot of people would probably say a medical doctor. Right. And medical doctors get very very little training on sleep there might be some exceptions here and there but by and large they get very little and so you know figures that get talked about are things like on average 20 minutes half an hour of training across their many years of medical training so it's, it's not enough so therefore it's not surprising that sleep isn't going to be at the forefront of their assessments um of, of when they're trying to make sense of the symptoms that someone is talking about um it, it, it makes sense that gps are going to be looking to medication perhaps rather than um cbt when it comes to insomnia and i don't i don't think that it's because they they don't care or they or they can't be bothered or i don't think it's anything like that i just i, I often believe um you know i think in most cases it's about just lack of awareness and um there does need to be a huge amount of education around that so um looking back i, I you know that the, the, the services that i've worked in um i think would have really benefited from all you know particularly mental health services i think everyone being skilled up trained up 
um, in the fundamentals of sleep, just as sort of how to integrate sleep into their standard assessments, certain things to screen for. Um, yeah, I, th I think that there's a whole piece of work that needs to happen there. Um, yeah, so is it, yeah, is it complacency? I'm, I'm not sure that's, that's possibly the, the way that I describe it, but but there's, there's definitely a need for much more education and training for, for health professionals around sleep. So then they can do a better job of picking up on it. And um, I suppose, you know, sleeping tablets are very heavily prescribed, aren't they, amongst psychiatric populations, especially in patients and, again, in prison, prison settings. Are we getting something wrong here? Do, is, there, is there much of a place for sleeping tablets? There, there is a place for them, but I think, from what I understand, they're being used um, at, at times where something like cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, say, would be much more appropriate. So there's, there's a couple of things there. Sleeping problems co covers such a, a massive range of types of sleep issues. So there are, I think, over 100 types of sleep disorder. And unless you're a specialist, you're not going to probably be able to distinguish between those. So, so prescribing sleeping pills for sleeping problems you know that that's an issue in itself because it's like well you need to understand you, know, you need to formulate that right you need to understand well what's what is this sleep issue what's causing that what's driving and what type of sleep issue is this and then often that means really referring on for a specialist sleep assessment for things like insomnia i, I still think that often you know that gps are um, prescribing medication is frontline but again in their defense what's the alternative right so it's so a nice guidelines the gold standard is cbt for insomnia it's a really really good really effective treatment for lots of people with insomnia but it's it's very hard to access it they you know it's not yet um commonplace across the uk within nhs services um so <laughs> it's it's it must be very frustrating to you know for those doctors that know what clients would really need and benefit for but if there's nowhere to refer them on to get that um then they're limited so that's that's an issue really in terms of there's a need for and actually i, I, I appeared very recently in the last few weeks that um there's going to be a major investment i think in nhs england in training up um certain health professionals to deliver um I don't know if it's full CBTI, but some form of version of it, um, which is, you know, I think it would probably in many respects, that's a good thing, um, increasing access to that. Yeah, it sounded like they could do it. Um, so I think, I, think, I think that's a big, sorry. No, I was just thinking it could do the equivalent of like IAPT, but for sleep, really, you know, there's uh, brief interventions to be available exactly. on a wide scale. Yes, and there, there are, so there's something called Sleepio, and that's an app. So that is has been rolled out in certain trusts within England. Um, and I think that's like all self-help, that's going to be most effective for people that are super motivated um, and probably for the milder end of the spectrum. But lots of people will need something, I, I think, a little, you know, sort of a step up from that, then a bit more tailored to them um, and actually um, working with um, a sleep specialist um yeah so I, th I think that's right that, that you know and that, that probably will happen actually because the cost to society of sleep um disorders is massive um so i, I think it's you know for the same reason there was an economic argument with iapt um and that was the thing that perhaps sh shoved them into cr creating that initiative I, I i think there's probably another piece of work to do there to actually just demonstrate that sleep is impacting on things like productivity and sickness and um so absolutely and, and i think the other thing to say there is is you know it's not just the health professionals i think people often want a quick fix and the appeal of taking a hypnotic medication that potentially has the power to get you sleeping when you haven't slept for ages well that's that's tempting right like the 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 longer that you've gone for with poor sleep the more desperate you're going to be like People that come to see me, they will have tried everything under the sun. They will have tried all the remedies they can get their hands on. They, they will have tried things that are, you know, there's no evidence base for, but just desperation. So I, I think it's understandable as well that people will go to the doctor and be like, I don't care, just give me whatever. But, but actually, um, you know, 
medications don't build skills and, and actually what what for something like insomnia specifically you know people need actually some education about the basics of sleep and they need skills to, to learn how to manage it can i ask you about melatonin chris because if you go to america you'll see almost as much melatonin in shops as you do guns i mean yards and yards and yards of it on the shelves there and yet over here you can't get it without a prescription why why do you think that is and actually a lot of people can't get it over here with a prescription either because i, th I think in the uk it's only licensed for 55 and over um and and i think in in under 18s i think so so for, there's a lot of people that can't get it in the uk um i think and i think it's the same in europe actually i think you can just buy it you know from a pharmacy and and it's you know uh, freely available um and i know plenty of clients i've spoken to who will order it you know or go to you know when they go to holiday in france or spain or wherever we'll, we'll pick some up um i th i th my understanding is that it's it's a relatively safe medication actually and, and compared to hypnotics you know it doesn't have the same level of side effects it's not as addictive so it's an interesting one that we you know are okay with prescribing hypnotics albeit usually for short term like seven days um whereas melatonin we've got much more stricter um regulation around that in the uk so it's an intriguing one um i know that the downside is is that if you just make it freely available and anyone can go out and buy it um you need certain doses and, it, and they're often minute doses it's not like the more the, the the better kind of thing um so they're often very very small doses and and the the, the dosage of melatonin also depends on what is you're trying to achieve so if someone's got a circadian rhythm issue um they'll probably need a different dose to someone who's taking it uh, because they're trying to minimize the impact of jet lag um, or someone who is trying to use it for insomnia. So I I think that there's, you know, regardless of how people are obtaining it, I think they need some guidance around dosage and timing as well. The timing of when to take it is really important. But as far as I'm aware, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not regarded as in the same categories, I think, as hypnotics when it terms, terms to the pretty hefty side effects. Naomi, I cut across you there. No, it's, that's fine. I was, so I was going to ask Chris, uh, ask you, Chris, about um, if listeners were concerned about their own sleep, sleep, what steps would you advise them to take? And I am hearing that, you know, it's very, it's very much an individual thing. But I wondered if there, whether you can offer advice as to how how, how people might find a way to resolve their sleep issues that might be, you know, what are the generic sorts of things people should be thinking about? Yeah. Yeah. And there are plenty of generic things that actually by and large are just sensible things for most people to follow. Um, I think th the risk of this is I, I can give you a list and I will, but they're often the things that people have already heard many times before the thing I would say is it's about consistency and that's where people tend to fall down is that they know it. A lot of it is like, it's not brand new information to them. It's nothing, you know, but, but the, it's, it's actually the consistency. And, and then what I'm interested in is working with people's barriers. Well, if you, you know this, right, you, you already understand that this is what you should be doing. Let's talk about why it's difficult to do this. And that's, I think that's where the work is. So um, things like having a wind down period before, bedtime it's, it's such good advice and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the busyness of our lives and you know it's a big ask isn't it to expect your brain to go from like busy day mode to this sort of tranquil sleeping night mode i mean it, it, it needs help so having this sort of buffer period of an hour to 90 minutes where you have a wind down is such a good idea and i would i would recommend everyone does that it's, you know I, I can't really think of a reason not to um it's just a sensible thing to do and it it will increase your chances of falling asleep uh quicker more soundly um and and the sorts of things i would say that to do in that are just anything that is not too stimulating and to a certain extent that's subjective but things that are quite calm nothing too um overly stimulating so you know don't don't start planning and strategizing by and large at that time um things that are quite quiet um gentle 
Um, people, you know, things that relax the whole body is a good idea. So people often will say like having a bath or doing some meditation or just some breath work. All those things are great. So if you get your body into a relaxed state, that's going to hugely help you to fall asleep. So I think the wind down period is really good. The other thing that um, people often talk about is anchoring your wake time which means basically imagine throwing an anchor down as like that's the time that I'm going to wake up seven days a week now clearly that's not suitable for everyone because of shift patterns and all sorts of things that might make it impossible but if you can if you're someone that in theory can do that it's a good thing to do because it builds routine it strengthens your circadian rhythm um, and all those things will help um, another thing that kind of follows on from that is making it part of your routine in the morning to get some natural light because again it strengthens circadian rhythm and if that's not possible so like if for whatever reason you can't get outside or would rather not um even just sitting next to a window is better than just being sort of um, surrounded in artificial light so that's a really good thing to do um and the other thing that again you know as a sleep specialist it can be a bit frustrating because you often have to say things that people will have heard so many times before but it's, it's for good reason and um caffeine and alcohol you can't talk about good sleep without talking about those things so people often will drink um to de-stress and with the belief that it helps them sleep better and there's you know, it, it might make you fall asleep a bit more quickly, but it even just a glass or two of wine or, you know, a, a beer or two will is enough to disrupt your sleep quality. You might not pick up on it. You might not wake up thinking that was a terrible night. But if you were in a sleep lab, you'd see it. Your your body, your temperature regulation would be all haywire. Um, the quality of your sleep would be disrupted. But you, you. So and that can actually follow on for a couple of days afterwards. So. I'm not saying everyone should, you know, go out and, um, you know, be give up alcohol forever, but but it, just something to know. It's, it's, it's just up, arming yourself with that knowledge. Um, and similarly with caffeine, a lot of people don't understand that or don't realize that caffeine has got a half life. So if you drink, you know, a, a double espresso at three o'clock in the afternoon, half of that is still in your system at nine. And some people are more sensitive to caffeine. So if you might be someone who's particularly sensitive to caffeine and you most people kind of have a sense of that in terms of how they feel after a strong coffee or tea then you need to be particularly careful about when you're drinking your last caffeinated drink and how much caffeine you consume over the course of a day and i'll just give a very quick example to that so i was once um, someone got as far as actually they must have seen their gp then they then they had a triage and then they got to see me at the sleep center for sleep problems and we talked about caffeine and they and they said, yeah, I drink a fair bit of tea. How much? How, how much are we talking? They said, oh, I don't know, 13, 14 cups of tea. But they, because they thought it was tea, it's, it's fine, right? It's not coffee. Um, so we had a chat and I convinced them to just test out, just experiment decaf. And they were like, it doesn't taste as nice. I was like, just go with it, try it. And lo and behold, the sleep problems stopped very, very quickly. So caffeine obviously you know it's a stimulant so it, of course it's going to impact on sleep um and it's, it's a helpful one to just hold in mind because we can sometimes lose track of how much we might be drinking thank you thanks chris so when you were talking about doctors not have not having much training on sleep i did there was a cynical part of me that did think well we'd be in problems if we taught doctors um all about the the need for you know the implications of sleep because we i think doctors training relies on them not not getting adequate sleep from what i can gather I know. But, yeah it, yes yeah and, and sleep seems to be very big business these days so there are apps special sheets mattresses all sorts what are some of the more unusual things you've come across that that people have tried to help them sleep unusual ones i mean there are some interesting things now i think there's there's this there's a type of clothing maybe like pajamas that that um claim to be able to i think measure or improve sleep and um, things that go under your mattress um 
as you as you said, all sorts of apps. So yes, there are lots of apps and and all sorts of unusual things like clothing and and um, things that go under the mattress. Um, um, yeah, but but I think what you said, Naomi, there about big it being big business is a, an important thing to remember that actually, you know, sleep tech, sleep gadgets. Um, there is a big push for those things because it's it's about marketing, it's about sales, and what I would say is that um, some of it, the 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 research behind it is is, is a bit flimsy, um, and it's not there yet. I think actually that that is the future. I do think that we will be using sleep gadgets, and I, and I do think we will be measuring sleep, um, you know, with with things that we can wear at home rather than going into a sleep lab. Um, you know, for sort of clinical work, I, I, it will happen. I have no doubt about that. But um, I, I guess I would just be a little bit cautious about the claims of some of these um, gadgets that are around. But yeah, but um, I think some of them are getting very good. You know, wearables. Um, you know, kind of the sleep tracking watches and things. They're, they're starting to get um, pretty decent, actually. Are there any particular things you recommend? Because they can be quite expensive, of course. Um, in terms of if you're particularly interested in sleep, um, then there are a few different devices. So things like um, the Aura Ring, um, the Whoop Band, um, even things like Fitbit and Apple Watches. Um, with each generation, each new kind of device that they release, because now they've all cottoned onto the fact that sleep is big business, they are now putting a lot of um, money into making sure that their devices are as good as they can be and they compare them against medical grade equipment so each generation they are they're all getting better um, what I would say is that um, even the, the best of those and we're not going to name which products I think are the best but they're you know some are better than others even the best of those are not perfect um, so for example I wear one of those devices and it regularly thinks I am fast asleep at 8.30 at night and I'm not. I'm just watching um, Netflix and um, very still and my heart rate is low, but it, it thinks I'm asleep, um, much to the amusement of my wife. Um, and, I, and she assures me I must be awake. So I, I haven't drifted off. So I, I think but the problem is, is that people place a lot of faith in, in the accuracy of these devices and read them as an absolute truth. And that can create a lot of anxiety for some people because they look at their sleep score first thing and they think, oh, my goodness, you know, I've had a terrible night. And then psychologically, that sets them up in a very negative, you know, they, they then perceive that they've slept badly. And then they spend the rest of the day thinking they've slept badly, whereas actually that's all hinges on their sleep score, which may or may not be accurate. Yeah. So you're advising everyone to be a bit cautious about uh about some of these things yeah. I, I th yeah i i yeah i think just treat it as it's um it's 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 a, a potentially useful reading to be curious about but also i think have faith in how you actually feel and if you feel refreshed and okay then you probably slept okay so so you've got into a, a new field of work uh, more recently which is working with footballers and other athletes how did this come about well it's interesting so i i do love sport i always have although i'm one of the least sporty people you'll ever meet um but i've, I've always loved football in particular um and when i was at a conference a number of years ago um, and they were talking uh, there was some really interesting research looking at athletes and it, I, I suppose i, I then start talking to some academics that work in that area and I just thought there's a massive need for this and when I started to look around at um, you know are, are there many sleep specialists working in sport the answer is no um, there are hardly any um, and the other thing about sport is that there's a lot of unregulated um, sort of pe people market themselves there's all sorts of different things within sports different types of therapists um, coaches specialists um and i think when i had a look at this you know what concerned me was that i think there's a lot of people that might be sort of marketing themselves as sleep specialists but probably haven't had um the sort of the, the training to, to match that really 
Um, and it concerns me because I've worked with so many people who've got sleep problems and, and they're vulnerable because they're desperate to get help. And um, and I think because of that, sometimes they're willing to try all sorts of different remedies and work with all sorts of different people. So I just thought there's a massive need for this. And um, over the course of the pandemic, really, I just started um, using LinkedIn to connect to people, started talking to coaches at different football clubs who were, and, and the thing I just found time and time again is that I, I, I hardly needed to talk about what I was putting together and, and the service I was developing. They were they were really interested. I was expecting to have to do this hard sell and I didn't because coaches were like, we get this. Yeah, this is needed. This doesn't exist at the moment. We don't have anything like this and um, and we need it. Um, and, and actually getting immersed in myself then in, in the literature and, and finding out that athletes are actually more prone to sleep problems than the general population so they're more likely to get sleep issues yet they get worse sleep and it's actually not surprising because of their training schedules or the travel they have to do um, the evening competition uh, the stress of elite level uh, sports um, injury so there's all sorts of things that are going to reduce their chances of sleeping well yet as an elite athlete, you know, it's probably more important than a lot of other people in terms of the quality of their sleep they're getting, given that performance is absolutely key and recovery is key. You know, sleep is, is essential, really. So I was quite amazed as well to, to think that um, sleep isn't already established in, in that area. It's quite surprising, really, isn't it? That yeah. you think that given the amount of effort that goes into perfecting what the body can do and the amount of effort that but I suppose nutrition you know if you look back to the 90s um players were much heavier in those days whereas yes now true you see a lot more sort of lean um there's some people really focusing on treating the body more like a temple I suppose in terms of what what goes in yeah that's true but but I, I and I think like if you look at America so in the US their sleep coaches are more it's still quite rare, but they are more um, ingrained, more more a part of sport, particularly things like baseball. Um, whereas in, in the UK, you know, that there is just a handful of people really um, working in, in the field of sleep, and and of those, you know, even fewer who perhaps got clinical training or therapeutic training. So um, it, it is surprising, and and especially getting to know clubs and, and work you know get to know different coaches and and when you look at you know they might have like four different goalkeeping coaches and a whole team of um uh, massage therapists and but they don't have any um clinical psychology input they don't have any sleep input and it's fascinating really when you consider how important mental health is and how important sleep is yeah at the moment football clubs are not seeing this as something they need to invest in most clubs and so we're, we're coming to the end of time really now, but besides trying to get a good night's sleep, what else do you do to look after your well-being? What would you recommend to, to anybody listening? Um, well, I think I think, again, it's, it's very sort of personal, really, and it's what works for you. But for me, I guess, you know, combination of um, a very busy family life and, and having young children and, and everything that comes with that, plus... Um, also, um, I'm lucky enough to be doing something that I love doing, but it's also busy and demanding and stimulating. So for me, it's about finding things that help me to uh, get some some calm and quiet. So, uh, f you know, and things that are nothing like my job, basically. So gardening, um, connecting with nature, um, things like playing board games, um, painting. So those sorts of things for me, um, I guess tapping into sort of some creative things as well. That for me personally, that that kind of brings some calm and some quietness, and, and um, which is good. It's that's important for me. But it's the sort of thing that you know I think it can take a while to figure that out in terms of what actually works for you. Um, but Yes, it, it's it's super important, and I and I think often therapists, psychologists, 
we don't always do a great job of looking after ourselves. Um, so it's, I, um, it's certainly an important thing to think about. Thank you very much, Chris. That's great. Great to have the chance to speak with you. Thank you. Chris, thanks very much. Really nice to meet you. Thanks, David. Likewise.